today in JASP. So our goal today is to learn not the language of R itself, because you don't want to be programmers, but to learn R in order to do statistical analysis. So yesterday, I kind of set up the lesson for today. So when we're fitting in an OVA model or a linear regression, yesterday kind of gets you an idea and a feeling of what it is and how to read it. And then we go in R today, we're going to learn how to program it. And the one of the great things about programming is that you could actually, so when you submit a paper, a lot of times they'll ask uh, how you came to your results and you have to submit your code. So you can submit your data and all your code and how to do it because your data has to be reproducible, especially if you're submitting in academia. So uh, a lot of uh, professors and researchers, they'll use code like R because they can save the code and everything they did is there for someone else to, re to reproduce it. Um, this is really important for research because if it's not reproducible, then it doesn't mean anything, right? It, you know, if, if it's your research and conclusions are the truth, then anyone that uh, tries to reproduce your paper should get the same results. When you use something like, um, like JASP or use some other software, if you can't, if someone else can't clearly see exactly what you did, sometimes it, it, it creates issues, right? So R is really, really good for stuff like that. I'm going to share my make sure present. Okay, so today is day three. And finish this slide. Okay, so today's topic is we we'll go over what is R and how we use it. I'm going to do a small demo of R Studio. We'll go over the rules of the programming language, and then we're going to go over some packages and uh, focus on mostly ggplot and the tidyverse. So. R is a free and open source uh, software that only allows for type codes and doesn't have any drop down menus. There are a few drop down menus where you can like, import data sets and stuff like that, but it's mostly uh, free form code. Uh, R is a great resource for, user, for users for new to programming. Um, I like to think of R as a bridge between general purpose programming and statistical computing. Um, the program language is designed specifically for statistics, so it's written in a way that a statistician would read code, which is really nice. Uh, most uh, program languages are written by software engineers and maybe um, computer engineers. And because of that, when you try to use a programming language for statistics, there's a lot of hoops you have to go through, right? One thing, if anyone's ever took a software engineering class or introduction to algorithms or programming class, you learn a lot about for loops you learn a lot about um, while loops and you learn about all these things to make your code really fast and how to move through data structures. With R, everything is vectorized. So you don't have to do any of that stuff. Very rarely will you have to do loops and all these uh, software engineering stuff because it's already built into R and actually really easy for you to do. R has built-in features that allow you to do any type of statistical method you can think of. So if you see something online or you think of something you want to do, there is a way to do an R, okay? R has everything from basic uh, statistics. It has packages you could bring in to do some advanced machine learning. It has uh, web development features. You could create uh, an, an interactive app so that people can access your data and do fun things with it. You could write reports in R using R Markdown. You can build really, really good plots. One of the things that R is known for is that how great its plotting is. Um, a lot of people use R over Python and SAS, which is another statistical computing software, just because of the plotting. It's so easy to use and the plots look great. Okay, so for someone with no programming experience, you can kind of think of R as like a fancy calculator where you have to type in exactly what you want to do. You don't have to do too much programming. There's no real algorithms, right? It's not as difficult as C++ or something you, or Java, something you might learn in a programming class. But with some of programming experience, you can learn R pretty quickly and they use it kind of help you learn statistics. So if you already got a feel of writing functions, all these cool things you do in software engineering and you switch to statistics, right? R kind of teaches you how to speak the language of statistics. R is really popular among academia. Many professors and educators use R many textbooks are written in R as if it's a real language because you can read it as a statistician. And once you get comfortable with R, it almost becomes a second language. And 
you'll see that once you get used to it, you could read our code and it becomes really smooth. In fact, uh, many textbooks are written with our language. So these are four textbooks that I used um, during my graduate studies. So every one of these textbooks will have uh, one or two lines of text and it'll have three or four lines of R code. And the R code is readable exactly how you would read it um, as in English almost. And one of, the, one of the benefits of learning R and taking time to learn it instead of using JASP is that it makes your future learning endeavors much easier. So when you start to learn some more advanced statistical methods and you want to get more into research, you're going to have to learn and get deeper into linear regression. You have to learn more about ANOVA, right? You have to learn more about some more advanced stuff, right? So like logistic regression is pretty popular. In order to do that, you really need a, a good working knowledge of R, right? Because all these standard textbooks are written with R. So it's in your best interest, even if you don't use it regularly to get really comfortable with the language, if you plan on um, plan on going forward with statistics or data science in the future. Once you graduate your bachelor's degree or your master's degree, and then you get into the real world, if you work in some type of software engineering firm or a tech company that like to use Python, right? Because Python is general purpose and everyone in the company can use the same language. If you work outside of tech, um, they like to use R and SAS, right? Because R is, uh, R is used in universities and R has built-in features to help you write reports and apps and all this cool stuff. It's, I, I highly recommend it if you plan on a future in data science, statistics or research, economics, sociology, even political science. It's incredibly useful. So R is the language, but R has an, a built-in IDE called R Studio, and this is where we work. So R Studio has these four sections. The first section on top right here is the script editor. This is almost like your document. This is where you could write code, you could edit it, you could delete it. Uh, you can change things. It's almost like a Google Doc, right? You can move things around. And this doesn't do anything unless you tell it to. This R console, this section right here, is uh, where the code gets run and the output gets come, comes out. So when you write a code in this R script editor. You can edit it, you can move it around, you can do all kinds of things. It will not run unless you tell it to. And when you tell it to run, it will come down to this R console and it'll run right here. And then you'll see the output of the code. This is where uh, a lot of the extra stuff goes. So when you create a plot, it's not gonna be in R console, it's gonna be in here. So the plot will show up right around here and it will uh, be you able to save it as like a JPG. Then it also have other stuff here. So you have, you see here is files. So here you click on files, you can see your working directory. You can see what files you could pull right on your computer. So you don't have to open a window on your computer to see what's in there. You actually see all your files from here. If you want to bring in a file, you could click on this. This is packages. We're going to discuss this later. So R has a lot of built-in stats stuff, but there are a lot of cool things that you can do that you have to download and then you can bring it to R itself. R also has a built-in help window here. So if you have a function, you don't know how to use it. Um, if you're struggling with something and you try to use something and it's not working, you could, you could use this help box and it'll tell you the source code, exactly how to use it, what variables needs to take in. It'll tell you what objects need to be in the function and it'll give you an example on how to use it. And it makes R really, really useful. If you use something like JASP, you don't get this. If you use something like Python, you don't get this. And SAS, you definitely don't get this. This is a global environment. Up here is where you're gonna see all your variables. So every time you every time you save a variable and you, you say you run this variable, I'm gonna say this n variable right here, and you run it comes in R code, and then it's gonna you can see right here. So if you're working on a long project and you don't know what variables you have, you can actually scroll down here and see all your variables you have saved. And if you click on this box right here, this is history. This is going to show you every code you've written since you opened your studio. And this is useful if you want to go back and see everything you did. Overall, pretty much everything you need as a programmer is right here. You never have to leave the screen. If you, if you use other languages, a lot of times they'll only have this part right here. R is specifically built for statisticians. 
there is no other person in mind when they built this language. It, it's built in such a way that it doesn't even have the same uh, program principles as some of the languages like C or Java. So we'll move on. Let's talk about the R language a bit. So most languages, um, if you sign a variable, you use the equal sign. So you see this a lot in math. If you take algebra, you would say x equals 5. And really, that's true. But we don't want to say x equals 5. We want to assign the value 5 to x. So if we have a variable called object, we use this arrow to assign the value to it. So this means that this uh, 5 is being assigned to object named object. And this is what's called a scalar. So this object only has one value, but we can have more values. For us, there's, there's four or five different types of objects. We're gonna focus on two. We're gonna focus on vectors and data frames. So a vector is a list of observations. So a ve this vector here, we, we say the name, we assign as vector, we use this arrow. And then this right here is gonna be stored in this variable named vector. So we use this C, letter C, and we put parentheses, and then these numbers are what get stored in this vector. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, all the way to nine, and then it's gonna be stored in here. I could also uh, use um, words or strings in quotation marks, but the, all the types inside the vector have to be the same type. So if these are numbers, they have to be numbers. If they're Letters have to be letters and so on. All uh, characters like letters need to be in quotation marks like they are right here. The next basic data structure that we need to know is called a data frame. So a data frame is a list of vectors grouped together. So here's an example. So I have this DF, this is gonna be my data frame. And I take this arrow and I'm gonna assign a data frame to this arrow. So this data frame, it's the function called data frame, contains two columns between two vectors. The first vector is numbers. Um, that's the name of the vector. And then I'm gonna say it's one, two, and three. And then the second vector is names. And it's gonna be first, middle, and last. Then if I run this code, it's actually gonna return uh, something you would see almost like Excel, where the first column is numbers. And then you have one, two, three in the first three entries. And the second column is names. And first, middle, and last is the second three entries. When we're reading in data, in R, it's going to re be read in as a data frame. So that you can think of this basically like Excel. And it's going to look exactly like Excel. It's going to have very, all the similar properties, it's just that now we're in R instead of in uh, Microsoft. So we can actually access the data within the object. So let's say we have this vector, and then we want to want to access the third element of the vector. We'll just use vector, the name of the vector. We use this square brackets and put which element we want to access. So this returns the third element of the vector, three. And this one is just a coincidence that I put three as a third. So three just means the third element. So one, two, three, and it'll return this one right here. If I did, uh, if this was, say names, I want to, do, to capture names. I put names, square bracket, three, I would get last. So it would be returned. This is more useful when you have a vector of variables and you want to pull one out. So I say the first one might be the mean, the second one might be the variation, the third one might be the standard deviation, so on and so forth. And you want to say, uh, what's, the mean, what's the mean of this variable? And then you know that you stored the mean as the first one and you say mean, and then you say one. And then for data frames, accessing is... Uh, a little different because it's a little more complex. So right here, we have the column name one, and the column name two. So if we want to access this column, we'll say DF, which is the name of the object. We'll say a dollar sign, and then we'll say uh, the name of the variable. So this we would say, if we want to access this C123, we would say DF dollar sign numbers, or we could say df and two square brackets and one. And this is the first vector inside this data frame, which would be the first column, which would be this numbers column. Or we could do df square bracket, uh, comma, 
one, which turn the first column. So to see this DF right here in the square brackets in the comma, this is this first uh, place represents the rows and the first, the second place represents the columns. So if I wanted to pull the first first row, I would put one comma, put nothing there and I put a bracket. If I want to, I want to take the first element of the first row, I could put DF square bracket one comma one square bracket. And now return the first element. Okay, we'll go over some more base, basic useful functions. And then we're going to go over, and I'm going to open up R and I'm going to walk you through some code and they'll make it a little bit easier for you to understand. So one of the most useful functions is this help function. So if you want to learn more about an object or you want to learn more about some type of function that you don't know about, you can use help and then put the name of the function inside or a question mark and then the name of the function. And it'll tell you how to use a function, what input the function needs. It might give you examples on how to use the function. And this is really useful as a beginner because you don't want to go Googling every function and trying to find examples. You could actually learn it while in R. Um, you also have the summary of an object, right? This summary function is used for all different types of objects, right? We could store uh, the results of tests, statistical tests as objects. We could, we could store data frames as objects, right? We have vectors, they're also objects. So this summary function could work on almost any object. And usually for a data object like a vector or a quantitative data frame, it will return the mean, the median, the min, the max, et cetera. And you could actually have, put some extra options in and tell it what you want to return. For a statistical test, it will return the readable output. So R is a statistical software. And really what it does, is it does math. So when you fit a statistical test, or we'll get to later, it, the results will actually be uh, code and, and math. To, to, to view it in a readable form, we actually use this summary function. And we'll get to that later. So this summary function is very useful. Another useful one is plot. So plot is a generic plot function. And uh, there's different variations of this plot function. But if you take a plot and you put an object in here, it'll read what kind of object you put in it and it'll plot it appropriately. You also specify uh, how you want to plot it, right? So if you had uh, a time series and you saved an R and you had the value of a stock every day for three years, and then you put this object in this plot function, it actually create a nice plot showing how the uh, price change over time, right? You'll actually look into the object, see what type of data structure it is, and then plot it. You can also specify how you want it to plot, right? So we could use it to make a scatter plot. We could use it to um, plot a function. We could plot a statistical test. And it's actually very useful. Yeah. This uh, most functions that we learn that are created uh, uses uh, function plot in a different way, but it's really important to get used to it. In R and the base functions, these base functions can be used with pretty much anything. And they have different purposes depending on what object we put inside them. Other basic functions uh, we use for vectors, even data frames, is we could use the hist function to create a histogram. We create a log function, take the log of a vector. And this will actually take the log of each component in the vector and create a new vector out of that. This is something I talked about earlier when I say that uh, R is vectorized. So in other programming languages, if you want to take the log of every, uh, every input inside that vector, you would have to do some type of loop. So you have to take log and you do on the first, first component. Then you take log again, do the second component and so on and so forth. If you have uh, a vector with maybe 10,000 observations, this can take a very, very long time. And it's a pain in the butt to program. And it makes the computer go really slow. But in R, everything is vectorized. So when we use a function like this, we use something like log, it actually take the log of every single component inside the vector and return a new vector that is the log of the previous one. And this makes R really fast and it makes it really useful for mathematics. We have something like the median, mean, the standard deviation, the variance, and the correlation. One thing we want to note is that R is case sensitive. Um, so something like plot is not the same as plot with a capital P. So we have to be very careful with uh, the capitalization of letters. So 
um, some more useful functions. We have uh, AOV, which is going to fit a Nova model. So the, there are many inputs we could put into it, but for us and our basic needs, we're going to put the formula for the ANOVA and we're going to put the data that we want to use. So we might save a data frame and we want to say data frame and we call it um, research data. We put it here and then the formula will involve the variables from our data frame, you know, for the ANOVA and linear model is the exact same thing. So in R, we have this standardized way of using formulas. And because of this, if you really know one or two formulas, you can learn them all. It makes actually things very, very simple. So linear model this is linear regression. Another term for linear regression is linear model. This function LM is going to fit in linear regression. And we're going to put the same inputs formula, comma, data. So formula is as follows. It's a dependent variable, tilde, which is usually in the top left corner of your computer and the independent variable. So if we wanna see, uh, like yesterday, we did uh, crime, uh, crime was dependent variable. That's what we put into JASP. And then we put something they called, in JASP they called it covariates. Here I'm calling independent variables. So you put crime here, tilde, income, and it return the same thing you did in JASP. To read in a file, um, there are many ways to read in files in R. There's a drop down menu where you could read in a file and find your computer, or you can uh, use functions like this. And then you say some read.csv, and you put file equals and the file location and the name in your computer. Um, in practice, we want to save, we would save the output of an object, and then we can use a function object to get better insights. So we wouldn't just say AOV and then formula and then look at the output. We actually save AOV as an object and then we could do cool stuff with it. So I'm actually gonna go over that right now. I'm gonna do a small example and work through some code and then we'll go to breakout rooms and everyone's gonna uh, work together. So stop sharing. I'm gonna share R, share. So this is the homework answers. <laughs> this is my R demo. So here is my environment. So right now my environment is empty. I have no plots yet. If I click on files here, I can see all the type of files I have in my ISL R lectures folder on my computer. This is my working directory and this is where I'm be working right now in R. I'll click here, I click packages, right? And then this is all the packages that I have loaded. I'm going to get to that later. I'm going to click help. And right now, uh, this is something I used earlier. So we have a viewer. So I'll move on for there. When I write a code here in this R script, it's going to be output, outputted down here. So right now, I'm going to save a, a vector called vec1. And its input is going to be 1 to 9. So if I now, if I click on this, if I highlight it, I can press run and then it's going to run my code down here so now this is where the r programming language does its work so now i can actually look and see what's inside there so you could write your code down here but it won't save here's where you're going to save it's almost like a, a document so all right vec1 i can actually see what's inside and then i could press enter and now i see it's exactly what i intended it to be then i can actually do cool stuff with it right so if I do this, I can highlight this, press run, and turn the mean of the vector down here. And I could also press, if I'm on this line, I can press control enter, and then I'm gonna get the same thing. Then I could, um, I could check the variance of the vector by using var vec1, and I get the variance of the vector. I could get the standard deviation. I have something called summary. So a summary is going to turn the min, the first quartile, the median, the mean, third quartile, maximum. So now I could assign this new vector the same exact way. So I'm going to do control enter. I'm going to check what's inside the vector to show you exactly where I said it was going to be. And this is where I stored the vector, these numbers. And I can do something like the core function. So core, I do vec1 and vec2, take the correlation between them two. 
And this is just kind of discussing some of the basic principles. If I wanted to save the results of this to come to a later, I could actually do something like this, put arrow, and then I could say mean, and then I have the mean there. And if I wanted to save the variance for later, I could be something like there, extend new variable, say there. I could say standard deviation, like that. And then I could say, I'm gonna save lar as a, the variance of VEC1, standard deviation as the standard deviation of VEC1. And then I could actually do something pretty cool. I could save these in another vector. So I could say my summary, pick an arrow. So this arrow is assigning whatever I put here is gonna be inside this, this variable. And I could say C, which means I'm creating a vector, mean, bar, SD. So right now I'm actually putting objects inside this vector. I can press again, and I define my summary right here. And if I write my summary, and you see in R, they're actually helpful hints so the, if you're struggling with code and you type something wrong, like see, I put three M's in summary, it actually corrected for you. And I can just enter and it fixed my code for me. And I put it in, it's exactly what I saved. So you could take results, put in vectors, save them for later and do a lot of cool stuff. And that's something you want to play with. We could also, uh, we could also save uh, strings and characters. So I put the character, which is name one, I put this in quotation marks and name two and so on and so forth. So we use the same C to indicate that's a vector. We put a parentheses here, so parentheses, parentheses, and then we can put uh, the name one, comma, name two, comma, and everything's quotation marks. And this is going to save it as a string, a string, a vector of characters. So then if I say, what's in VEC3? I put VEC3 here. Then I see everything I have saved. There are a lot of also cool functions in R that we're not going to get into, but if you play around with them, you could definitely uh, do some cool stuff. So in VEC1, I wrote 1 to 9. I wrote it all out. But that's kind of a pain in the butt, especially if I did 1 to 100 or something along like that. There are cool things in R that make things much faster. So this function is called sequence. And this is a sequence of starting at 1, that ends at 9, and we increase by 1 each time. So if I do this, it's going to return the exact same thing. Let's say I didn't know what the sequence does and I wanted to learn. So I press question mark, S E Q, sequence, put the quotation marks, I click on it. Now, this question mark opened up this help place right here. So now, if I didn't know what this function did and I need help because some reason I can't make it work, I could read the description. So this sequence, this S E Q function, it's uh, called sequence generation, right? This is what it does. The description is it generates regular sequences and SEQ is a standard generic with the default method and all these other things. So it'll say the usage and it'll say SEQ and then this, these three dots, I mean, this is where you put the stuff and it'll say some default stuff. So SEQ from equals one, two equals one and so on and so forth. And we can put all these cool stuff in here. So we have from here, this is an argument you could put in. So this right here is from, so I could do this from, from equals one. And I could do, then I could do two, two equals one equals nine. And then by one, that I can't get it to work. I click question mark or I could press help sequence. And so the same thing, the help function. And then you actually go down, look at the function. You can see what it's supposed to do. Make sure it's actually the right function you want. You can see all different variations of the function. You can come down and see the arguments, what arguments you have to put in, what you have to put into them. You have some details. And then you could have some typical usages right here. And you come down, and there's even more explanations, right? And usually there's some examples. But here's examples right here. So if you didn't know how to use it, you can do something like this, and then you can play with these examples, and it'll tell you what they're supposed to do, right? This is actually really, really useful because uh, if you're learning R, there's a lot of cool stuff that'll help you. So let's go back to 
um, our lesson. So we go back to date, data frame. So let's say you want to create a data frame, a data frame with these vectors inside them. So we want these vectors. I can actually do something called df. I'm going to put this arrow to assign the value to df. I'm going to use a data frame function. So data.frame will create a data frame. Then in the parentheses here, I'm going to put the three columns I want. So I have column one is going to be vector one. Then I'll put a comma. Column two equals vector two. Then I'll put a comma. Column three equals vector three. And I don't need a comma anymore because it's the last one. So I run this code. I could highlight it and press run. Or I could have just pressed control enter and do the same thing. Now, I say I want to view this code. So I could press DF and just put it down here and it'll print, which is really cool. But what if this data frame had 10,000 values in it? All right, then you're not going to be able to see 10,000 values in this little space. So we can do something like this. You could say uh, capital V, IEW, -E and D, uh, DF. And we're going to just click on this, control enter. And it's actually going to open up a, a new tab that looks exactly like an Excel spreadsheet where we can see the value of uh, column one, the value of column two, the value of column three. This is really useful for visualizing your data, especially when you're not used to looking at an R, right? So it gives a nice transition from Excel into R. Then we do some right here. We have head. This is going to show the first five rows of R, of the data frame. So we click this. And then if you have a, uh, com a data set with 10,000 uh, rows, now you only see the first five. And this is useful if you want to make sure that you assign the first column to the right way and the second column the right way and third column the right way. So this is really good checking. And you can also say, check, there's a dim function. So dim, uh, in the parentheses, you put df, which is our function. And this will tell you the dimensions of it. So if we're expecting 20,000 rows and we got nine rows, so this first dimension is a row, the second one is a column, then we know we made a mistake, right? And these functions are really useful for looking at the data when it's really, really big. When it's really small like this, we could just look at it, right? But very rarely we're gonna have nine observations. Ideally, the more observations we have, the better inference we're gonna make. So we want something like a thousand observations, ten thousand observations. If you go into data science, you might see two hundred thousand, a million observations. So you're never gonna be able to look at something like this. You're gonna need this uh, head function. You're gonna need this dim function to, to give you an idea of what the data frame looks like. Now, if we want to access values inside of the data frame. We could do something called DF, which is our object, dollar sign, and which column we want. So if I click on this one, I press control enter, it's going to return the values of the first column. We could also uh, return the same thing by using double brackets and one, meaning the first column, and press control enter, it's going to turn the same thing. And we could do DF, bracket, comma one, which is going to return the first column of the data frame. So we control enter, and it's the same thing. If we wanted the first value of the first column, we do df, we want row one, column one, and we press control enter, it's return the first value. If we wanted the ninth row of the third column, so we say nine, three, control enter, and we're getting the ninth the object, the input in the ninth row, the third column. This usage of data frame is probably the best way to do it because you could do some type of, you could do like mathematical stuff like this. For df.col1 and df double bracket one, this is returning a vector and it's actually taking it out of the data frame, okay? But when we have df we have bracket comma one, we're still working the data frame format. So I can actually edit the data frame and then I could replace this data df one. So we're now saying df comma, df bracket comma one bracket. And this is the first column of df. And I say, I wanna redefine this column. I say, I don't want vec one as the column, but I'm not gonna run this code again. Maybe we've been coding for a couple hours, Right? Maybe it's a couple of days working on a project. Maybe this function is all the way on top. And now we're all the way on the bottom. Right, And I don't want to scroll up and find it. If I scroll up and find it, it may affect code after it. So I say, I want to redefine the first column here. Well, I could use this exp 
function here. This is going to take the uh, exponent, exponential, so e to the value of the, all, all values in the column. So I do this, so, and then this is 1, e to the first power, e to the second power, e to the third power, and so on. So I say I want to define this first column as the exponential of the first column. And I can do that. Now, if I look at df, I can go here, I can view it. And now it changed. So now our object is completely different than what it was. So we could edit and change all the values in our object. And it's actually pretty easy once you get used to the code. So if I want to go back to it, I can use this log function, right? So log back one. I could do something like this, df bracket comma one, which is the first column arrow. I'm assigning a value to that first column. And we say log of, and we say df, say column one, right? Um, this is going to bring the log of the exponent log and exponentials cancel each other out. So this log is actually the natural log in uh, mathematics and statistics, there's no such thing as log base 10. They teach you that in high school because it's easier to transition to logs from tens than it is in exponentials. But this log is uh, the natural log. Okay, so we say control enter and we look at df again and it's back to exactly what it was. We could do that with all kinds of stuff. So if I said df, I'm going to say row one, position three, what I say is quotation marks, that's the speedo, I do that. Oops, speedo is assigned, check, and I changed it. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to reading data. So reading data is uh, pretty simple in R. So this is, um, ideally you want to do something like this so that when you're um, running the code again, so if you do it today and you come back to it tomorrow, you could just press control enter and the code reads in. So here I read in the county CSV file from yesterday. So I read in the county CSV file. I saved it as counties. Now this counties is a data frame. So I say view right here, actually view counties. Enter, and I can see it here. Just like we saw in JASP, just like we see if we open up Excel. Or I could go uh, over to uh, import data set, and then I could do choosing what type. So I have Excel, I could, I could bring an Excel spreadsheet, and these are from other statistical software, Stata, SAS, SPSS. Here we're gonna focus on uh, base, so it's from text base. So it's going to read as TSV. So I come down and I can find the file I want. So I have a lot of files here. I have documents. I click on downloads. I look at my downloads. I click on um, some files I have from all lectures. I can go down. And I say, I want to look at this county's file. So I say open. So then it's going to take this as the input file. And it's going to say, this is what we're going to save it as. OK. Now, all you have to do is say that, well, this row here is the column names. So I want to make sure that it knows that's column names. So row, let's say row names is the first row names, not row names. We need column names. Uh, heading equals yes. So now the row names are exactly where they are in the spreadsheet. And then I can press import and import it for me. So now county. So now counties is saved and it's using this right here. Okay. If I want to save this back into my spreadsheet so I can come back to it later, right? I could always copy, paste. And it's going to turn the same thing. Okay. So you could do either or. But if, if you're still learning, this is what I did when I first started. I would always import the data set through here using clicks. And then after I would finish, I would copy the code from this console, right? Because R is not just bringing in, it's actually running code for you. I copy this code, I'm going to paste it in the R script. And then I could run it. And next time I come in, and it's going to work. I'm going to close this for now because I have it already. We have this uh, 
really nice function called structure. And uh, structure is going to tell us the structure of the data set. So I click this. It's going to tell me uh, what type of object it is. So it's a data frame. It's going to tell me the number of observations, the number of variables. It's going to tell me the name of each variable inside and how to access them. So if I said counties, dollar, dollar sign region, I'm going to get this variable right here. And it's going to tell me the type of variable, the character, character, it's integers, integers, it's numeric, right? Numeric means it's decimal places, integers, so on and so forth. Then if I say, I want to check the dimensions, which they're right here, but I can also check it with the dim function that we used earlier. Hit dim, and it's the same thing. So 3,141 rows, 21 columns. Then I could use functions like hist. There are plenty of built-in R functions. So hist, and we say counties, and I want the crime, crime variable. So I do the counties, which is right here, the object I saved. Dollar sign, which is telling me which row, which column I want. I want the crime variable. I could do this. I could highlight it. I could press run. I could press control enter. And now I made a histogram. So I can move this around if I want. And then this is a histogram of the counties. And R, it's so easy to build histograms and they're very, very easy to read. So I can see the frequency, I can see the variable. It has a um, title already. And this might not be something you put in your paper. This is something that if you're exploring your data, this is really, really easy to see and simple to use, okay? They're the base R functions that create plots are used to um, <clears throat> are used to visualize the data before you do statistical tests. If we're creating plots for a uh, paper, there's actually other functions that we could use. We're going to go over those a little later. We also do a plot function. So I say I want plot. I also want a histogram. I could say X. Actually, we'll come back to the histogram later. So let's go back to a uh, ANOVA. So I say we want to do uh, ANOVA. So we use the function AOV. So let's actually use a help function. So we use help, AOV, and let's see what it says. Here we go. So AOV fits analysis of variance model. This is ANOVA, A-N-O-V-A, ANOVA model. So the description fit analysis of variance model by call to LM for each uh, stratum. So we use a formula, data, and then there's other things we can do we're not going to really worry about. So it tells you, uh, what the form use, form of test by mile, the data, and other things. It gives you details on how to use it, and it has some cool stuff. Um, it'll return uh, some references, see other functions that are similar. It'll give you examples. <laughs> and this is really easy if you're learning to start and learning how to code. One thing, one thing I like about R is for beginners that are program before is that you're learning how to do statistics. But you're also learning how to program. So you're using these codes to learn how to do statistics and it's helping you out, but you're also learning program principles so that when you switch to something, maybe like Python in the future or Julia is a very new language that's coming out, it's very popular. It's coming very popular. It's actually very easy to switch between languages because they all follow similar syntax. So now I'm gonna save this uh, ANOVA model as ANOVA. So this is what the object this is, how I'm naming it. So my function, it's crime, this is a dependent variable. And here I put Democratic majority, I'm gonna put region, region. So it's the same thing as yesterday. If we do AOV, crime, and uh, independent is region. These are the categories, data equals counties. And I'm gonna press control enter and I save it. Now, if I wanna see it, I can press summary. And in the, in the parentheses, I put ANOVA, which is the object. And now it's gonna tell me, everything I need to know. And there's no fluff in this. So when we looked at JASP, we saw a bunch of stuff and it's a little confusing. Here, it's three lines. So we have region, residuals. We don't really need to know this stuff. This is, if you study statistics, this is important. For us, it doesn't really matter. This probability greater than F, this is the p-value, okay? This is what we're interested in. We want this to be less than 0 0.05. And then this says it's really, really, really small. So see these stars here? If you didn't know how to read this, a star means significant. So star means 
the probability is basically zero, three stars. Two stars, the probability is less than 0 0.01. One star is less than 1%. And then, no, three stars is less than 0 0.01. Two stars less than 0 0.01. One star is less than 0 0.05. So anything with a star is good for us. So we don't even have to look at this p-value. All we have to do is write summary, check if there's a star. It actually makes reading it a lot easier for someone who doesn't actually understand statistics that well. We don't even have to look at this or anything here. We just check, is there a star? If there's a star, good. If there's not a star, then we see no results. Then we can go on from there. We could do other things. So we could actually use this to do the same t-test we did yesterday. So I don't know if we talked about this yesterday, but a t-test and ANOVA are the same thing. It's just that a t-test is two categories, and ANOVA is three or more. But if we fit this with uh, a two-category independent variable, then we actually get the same results as a t-test. So I can actually do democratic, democratic. So actually, I could do counties, and I could put dollar sign. If I didn't know the column name, put dollar sign. And then I can actually scroll down and choose which variable I want, Democratic majority. And then I'm just gonna erase this here. So now I wanna see, fit another ANOVA, and I want it to be basically function like the t-test from yesterday. So I click Control Enter, I can check Summary ANOVA, and it tells me the same thing. If you remember from yesterday, our p-value for the t-test was 0 0.051. So R is a little more accurate and actually tells us that, hey, this is not really significant, right? Because there's no star, but it's really close, right? So it's less than 10%. So it's actually really useful for you if you're trying to decide what to do and not to do. These uh, values here are super, super useful, right? And make you don't have to know any R code. You don't have to know any statistics. You just know if it's a star, it's significant. If there's no star, it's not significant, okay? If there's a star, the results are good. We found what we wanted. If there is no star, then we didn't find the results that we wanted, okay? So let's move on to uh, linear models. So before we do that, let's do a plot. So let's say I want to plot a scatter plot with a crime. So this, this we we'll use a tilde here. Oops. If we use a tilde, this is a function. So if we do something like y tilde x, something you see in math, that's equal to uh, the function y equals mx plus b. This is something you see a lot in like algebra and stuff like that. So that's what we're fitting. That's kind of the same thing. So this is the y. This is our dependent variable, prime. This could be on the y-axis. We have a tilde. So this tilde uh, represents this right here. And this represents our x. This is our independent variable. So I say plot. Then I see, then I get a nice scatter plot here. With all the variables here, and I can see there's a trend. We did something similar in Jasper yesterday. We saw that, well, there is a positive trend, right? But it's really scattered. So it's not perfect correlation. So I want to know, are they related? So I can do, uh, use this linear model function. So LM, I have the parentheses here. And I have the function here, crime, income, data, equals counties. And then I could fit the model and save it as L mod. So L for linear model. Or you could do linear regression if you want. So you could do L reg for linear regression. And then you could do L reg here. So I control enter again. And I say summary of L reg. And I get results. So you look at these results. It's going to tell me right now the formula I used in the call. And then it's going to tell me the residuals. We don't really care about this, right? Not because it's not important, but because we don't have the statistical knowledge to go forward and learning about these. All we care about here is this. And we see that there's no fluff again. We just go look at the stars. There are stars. It's significant. Awesome. Then let's say we want to do it again. You could say, all right, let's do it one more time. And I want to bring in uh, what's another variable we use. So let's check the variables. So I'll say counties, and I can do dollar sign. I can say, see the variables. And I want to say college. And then I could go back, control enter, right again, summary again. And I can see that 
They're both significant. Three stars. All right. This is good. This is high significance. All right. The same thing we got yesterday, except I don't have to look at these numbers. I could just look at these stars. It's super easy to use. And I could say, I want to try again. So now this is income, it's college. I could say plus whatever variable I want to use. So counties, dollar sign. And I could scroll down. Let's check if income farm, Democrat. Let's look at uh, population density. So I'm going to move this right here. And then I'm going to control enter. So I'm bringing from your reg. And I see all of them are significant. Okay. They're all really, really significant. And we can keep doing this in R and fit the best models. And you don't have to look at any of these numbers, get confused. What does this mean? Uh, I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. No, just look at the stars and it tells you it's significant. Really, really useful for someone who's doesn't have a background in statistics but wants to do some research. One thing I want to touch on is that when you're writing code, sometimes you, you write some code and say, I don't know what I did. And you go back to a couple of days later and you say, it doesn't make sense. All that's something uh, called, you can put like these little hashtags and then we write a note here. So here I wrote hashtag basic commands. And this can tell me that this is some basic commands that I was going over. And then I here put hashtag reading and data. And here I read the data. These hashtags aren't uh, read in, and they're not, they're not actually used in the console here. So if you write something like, if you put uh, hashtag back one, then if I run this code, nothing happens. This vec one doesn't exist yet. So this is really useful if you want to write something here. So I want to say in VEC1, I assigned numbers 1 through 9. And then here, if I'm running the code, if I do something like this, it comes in here. And this code is not evaluated because this is a comment, but this code is. So this is really useful for you when you're beginning and you're writing notes and you don't know what you're doing. You can actually take notes in R while you're doing it. Okay. So I'm going to stop my share.